Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, for scheduling the uh, Space Leadership Preservation Act hearing. Uh, thank all the panelists for appearing and for the wisdom and foresight that uh, you've shared with us so far. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of criticism from uh, different directions about this proposed legislation, but I've not heard one single person propose an actual solution to the problem that we have uh, of lack of programming and, and foresight and how we're going to get on track and stay on track and keep America's space program first. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think uh, you brushed over the beginning uh, a litany of events that kind of throws us into uh, instability even more. I mean, we have, we have a candidate that runs for office that says if he's elected president, he's going to abolish NASA and put the money in education. Then when he appears on the Space Coast, he says, I'm going to close the gap between uh, the shuttle and Constellation and keep America first in space. Then he gets elected and he asks for the NASA administrator's resignation. And he doesn't fill the position. So when they're doing their planning and strategic planning for the uh, uh, administration's uh, future, the NASA administrator's seat is empty. That's kind of a shame. So then we get, finally get a, a great NASA administrator appointed. And then we have an Augustine Commission appointed. I may have these two out of order a little bit to tell him what to do. And the Augustine Commission says, of course, the shuttle is terribly dangerous and needs to be scuttled. Uh, we all know better than that. We know they were designed for over 100 missions, and uh, they were only the 35th mission. So mile per mile is safest space travel, spacest travel of any kind in the history of mankind. Um, and we know the catastrophes, the tragedies were human error. It wasn't any failure of, of NASA. And so then we go in a different direction, and, and, and we have SLS and Orion now, which I think are great plans, great goals, uh, but we have an administration that, frankly, underfunds them. They suggest them, promote them, and then underfund them. Uh, so then NASA ends up uh, being criticized that they can't keep up schedules that they've foreseen before, and we know when you delay projects and instability, it's going to cost, cost increases too. So, um, you know, you have to wonder if, if, if you are NASA or you're a NASA employee or a potential NASA employee or even just a bright STEM student or like the 18,000 who applied to be astronauts, what is our future going to be? What is our future going to be? And, and I love Neil deGrasse Tyson when he says, you know, that our investment in space is fundamentally, basically, the only thing our Congress does strictly for future generations, to benefit future generations. And so I think uh, Congressman Culberson's bill is, is much too important to ignore, not only for those reasons, but for reasons of national security, uh, our technological advancement, and eventually the survival of our species. Uh, now, you know, Dr. Griffin and Colonel Collins, China is rapidly developing the uh, capability to access and use all regions of cislunar space. Uh, if the United States cedes that and moon base uh, sole use to China, uh, what do you foresee as the strategic and long-term impacts on the uh, national interest of our country? Well, you mentioned me first, so I'll go first. Uh, Mr. Posey, thank you. Um, I have a couple of comments on that. First of all, I think you can infer all that needs to be inferred about how the Chinese will behave in space by watching today how they are behaving in the Western Pacific and the concern that that causes uh, not only the United States uh, but all nations in that region. Uh, there is no reason to suppose that they would behave any differently in space and I think that should give us concern. More broadly, um, since World War II, the United States has been uh, a superpower, and one certainly would say, I think, the superpower in the world. Um, the world is a better place when that situation is so. 
I, I believe Western values and customs and respect for individual rights and the rule of law uh, matter. If we want those cultural values to prevail upon the, in the new frontier that is space, then we will have to be there. The decisions are made by the people who show up, not by the people who watch on TV. Um, for those reasons, which I believe are existential for our culture, uh, we need to be in space, first among equals, irrespective of what China or any other nation seeks to do. Thank you. Thank you. Colonel? When the Apollo 11 crew landed on the moon, 1969, they put a plaque that said, we came in peace for all mankind. <clears throat> I'm not sure China would put a plaque like that on the moon. Um, I am concerned about China. I'm not an expert on China, so I get that in the record. But I'm not sure what their intentions are. And as Dr. Griffin said, they're, we can only guess based on what they're doing now, what their performance is. We don't really cooperate with China in space, although we cooperate with all other nations, and I believe in international cooperation. Um, whether or not we cooperate with the Chinese is a big question mark. Um, it's just a little bit, a little bit scary, and, and sometimes part of me says competition is good in many ways, and if we ever end up in a race back to the moon against China, um, that might give us a little kick in the pants okay. to get out there and do it, whether it's the moon or Mars or whatever we're doing in space. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Posey, did you